Ryan Gurrens from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania says there are many different types of telescopes with a variety of sizes, but none of them have the resolution to actually see exoplanets. So my question is, how big would a telescope have to be to have the resolution to actually see a nearby exoplanet? Could we align multiple telescopes on Earth to make a telescope effectively as large as one of our planet's hemispheres? And would that even be big enough? Doesn't he, I, I, I'm betting, because we do have images of planets, I think this questioner wants to see continents and oceans and, and cities. What do you think? I mean, because I'm right there with you, Neil, that we, we've we seen exoplanets already, right? Again, they don't look like Earth so far. And we just got a couple of pixels. Although, you know, as Carl Sagan's famous moniker of the pale blue dot from Voyager 1 spacecraft, and it's, you know, out at the edge of the solar system, looking back at Earth, you just see a pale blue dot. So we're not yet at the level of continents and oceans. But actually, one really cool thing about the Habitable Worlds Observatory, you might actually be able to get a sense of oceans because of how the light you would have the glint coming off of the water. So to get mm. to the stage of continents is pretty far off. I haven't done the math on what you would mean to do that. It seems hard, but certainly we can take pictures of exoplanets now from the ground um, that are big like Jupiter. And again, with HWO in the future, we'll be able to see the planet itself um, without that level of detail. So not to dis Pluto even more, mm -hmm. but when you described this pale blue dot image taken by the Voyager 1, prompted by the efforts of Carl Sagan, when Voyager 1 exited the solar system, that picture was taken when Voyager 1 passed Neptune. Mm -hmm. That's the edge of the solar system. <laughs> wow. <laughs> it was well inside of the orbit of Pluto. Yep. So the idea was aliens would come upon our solar system and they'd see the first planet, and that would be Neptune. Mm -hmm. and that's when they take a picture of all uh, in, inside. So I didn't want people to think the edge of the soul that they were way out there. No, it was relatively nearby, right? Yeah, relatively nearby, exactly. Because we saw a picture of the family portrait, right? It was taken on Valentine's Day in 1990, right? It's showing mm. the love, right? The love of <laughs> a couple of pixels here and there. Yeah, yeah. All right, time for a few more, I think. Yeah, absolutely. So um, Jay Starks from Waco, Texas says... Here and reporting for cosmic query duty. I, <laughs> cool. okay. I've been thinking a lot about how planets in our solar system are impacted differently by the distance from the sun, such as temperatures and the number of days it takes each planet to orbit our Helios. Do all exoplanets follow this pattern with their stars too regarding distance? I'm curious if this is a universal truth for all exoplanets in outer space. Interesting. I think he's asking, are the laws of physics that describe orbits, does it change from one planetary system to another? I mean, the beautiful thing about physics is you don't have to have a great memory. The same rules apply over and over again. So you just have to learn it once. But I think it's kind of interesting to think about the solar system because, you know, Bodhi's law, right, Neil, right? How back in the day when people were looking for, you know, Uranus and Neptune and things, they would look at the distance from the star, from the sun, and say like, oh, there's a planet at these geometric distances. And so then they found the planet and they went, yep, that checks off. And then they said, oh yeah, we found Ceres because back then Ceres dwarf planet was viewed as a planet. And then they said, oh yeah, there's these other things. And then it didn't quite work. And so we stopped. But the notion of ah, distances from the star having planets is one that people have thought a lot about over history. And I think it's actually pretty cool that when we look out at these exoplanet systems, what we see looks nothing like the Earth um, and the solar system, and that's partly because they're different systems, but also even within our own solar system, everything moved around. You know, Jupiter and Earth didn't just form exactly where they are today. They uh, did a little dance to get there. So planet migration. Yeah. What's going on there, yeah. So I'm reminded that when Isaac Newton first wrote down his gravity equation, and it worked for Earth and the moon, and it worked for the sun and Earth, it also worked for Jupiter and its moons. So it wasn't just like a sun thing, it was, oh my gosh. And so that we correctly, though audaciously, said it's a universal law of gravitation. Mm -hmm. That's kind of bold, but I mean, why not? Well, we're, we're egocentric as humans, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, while we're talking about moons, there's a moon question from Fred Dog. That's a patron Fred Dog. I don't know if you're from the Westchester Fred Dogs, any relation? <laughs> but. Fred Dog oh, says, know Fred Dogs. <laughs> it was once thought that habitable worlds had to exist within the habitable zone and would require a magnetic field to protect itself from harmful solar wind particles. However, this has since been determined to not necessarily be the case. 
as our understanding of habitability continues to grow. Now moons like Enceladus and Europa have become candidates for housing possible life, but fortunately, they also happen to be protected by the magnetospheres of their respective planets. My question, how has the inclusion of moons further complicated the search for life beyond our solar system? I love that. And I'm gonna add to it, it, will there come a day where we just abandon this concept of habitable zone because if the conditions are ripe somewhere else and it's not in the zone, it could have life. So maybe the habitable zone concept is is constricting our creative thoughts of how, when, and where we might find life. Yeah, so I mean, it's great that Fred Dog mentions these moons, right? Europa and Celadus, where you might have this thick layer of ice and you've got all this heating that makes a nice cozy ocean underneath. So one of the things about the habitable zone, like I said, that fine print, long liquid water may be found on the surface here, right? If there is life under the ice, you won't be able to see it from the atmosphere as we know of now, right? So when we talk about the habitable zone, it's about where could we actually look at our telescope and say, maybe there's a biosignature for life here. So it's not saying that moons are out of the question. People are definitely looking at moons. I think David Kipping, who you frequently have on this show, you're yes. down the street there in New York. He's always thinking about exomoons. And so- He's up the street. He's up the street. Excuse me, and my old <laughs> age New York is a very specific about direction. Yeah, yeah. Get my New York straight here. No, yeah, he's up at Columbia, and we're delighted when he's when he's on the program. So you know, I don't know if we can detect the signatures of life from a moon yet, but it's one of the things that we want to look for. And actually, the question of does it complicate things? Yes, because if you want to get the signature of a moon, now you have to get rid of all the information about the planet. You can't just say, oh, I'm only seeing the moon there. In the same way that when we study exoplanets, we have to get rid of the star to study the planet. So there's a different level of complexity. And to your point, Neil, of maybe it's time for a new definition. I think it's just, you know, you need something without the asterisk and the fine print of, you know, liquid water right. on the surface here. And let me tell you how old I am. So when I was in graduate school, the Voyager mission was doing its grand tour and everyone was in high anticipation of what it would discover about the planets. And when it started imaging the planet moons, oh my gosh, the moons became more interesting than the planets themselves. And now people don't care about the planet. <laughs> <laughs> Jupiter's moons are way more interesting than Jupiter, by far. I, I, I don't know, I'm speaking out of turn here. But tell me, would you, you, you gotta agree with at least some of that sentiment here. I think that moons are spectacular, right? I mean, I think the fact that, you know, you can look around Saturn and see hundreds of moons and they all, you know, you've got ones that look like the Death Star, right? Yes, it's got this big crater in it. It looks like the Death Star bit that would right. send out the ray. Yeah, it's, don't you guys call it the Death Star moon? I think we normally call it Mimas, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> we can have different okay. names, sure. 